Automax Highlights. And here's your host, Karin Helmstedt. Hi there, and a warm welcome to our highlights of the past week, lining up this time with the following headline stories. Crack climbers, the wide boys, conquer the off-width climbing world. Lush life, natural gardens look great and are easy to tend. And capped chef Holger Stromberg cooks up a storm for the German national soccer team. Well, they are expert crack climbers, and the story of how they got to where they are is a compelling one. The British duo of Tom Randall and Pete Whitaker, alias Wide Boys, decided they had the right stuff to tackle the world's toughest off-width cracks and set out to put the American crack elite to shame. Well, off-width climbers look for cracks that are wide enough for a hand, but not wide enough for legs or body, which makes their feats seem almost superhuman as we can see in their second film of crack climbing exploits. The only way to scale this rock face is by following an almost invisible crack. These images from the documentary film Wide Boys 2 show an extreme and unconventional sport that demands power, stamina, and an immunity to pain. I really like doing things that are different from what other people like doing. So if people think it's a bad idea that I should do crack climbing, then I think it's a good idea. Crack climbing requires a lot of training. Tom Randall and Pete Whitaker spend a lot of time in the Peak District in Northern England. Bandages are crucial for avoiding hand injuries. And mastery of certain techniques is also extremely important. The wide boys are constantly developing new ones to make their climbs easier. People perceive it as being difficult. Uh, when they first do it, they don't have the techniques and then it can be really painful and they'll probably end up losing a lot of skin off their hands and off their elbows and knees and then they'll think it's a really horrible experience and then they'll think it's really difficult. Uh, but actually when you do it a little bit and you have the right techniques then it can be just as easy as doing normal climbing. After the wide boys had acquired the right techniques to master England's most challenging cracks, they decided to go further afield. Three years ago, they set themselves the challenge of the Century Crack in Utah, a previously unclimbed crack in a breathtaking environment. Their exploit was documented in the film Wide Boys. The width is an off size, it's a, it's a bad size, because when you try and fill the crack with your body, nothing quite fits. So you have to try and um, make up a lot of techniques that you, you don't learn in the early days of climbing, and that's why it's so hard. And if, even when you climb it a lot, it's still quite painful. The duo don't always train in the open air. To prepare for Utah's century crack, they spend two years practicing in their basement after creating a purpose-built climbing wall. Nowhere else, or no, no other climbing walls obviously have anything like this. And it was really important that we had something specific that was exactly the same as this climb because this climb hadn't been done because it was so specific really. and so demanding in that sort of style, so we had to build this. To... And they've continued training in their basement for the world's other challenges since. And they also train in their garden. This is where they prepared for the Cobra Crack in Canada. They recorded this challenge in their second film, Wide Boys 2. It took several attempts before they managed to master the 30 meter long crack, a spectacular achievement. The wide boys always push themselves to the limit. We train really hard. We're sort of always on this margin of actually breaking ourselves training. 
and then we go outside and then it kind of all seems okay because you push yourself so far inside or training that everything outside is kind of fun and a lower intensity and then you tend to succeed on it. Next up is the legendary El Capitan in Yosemite National Park. The vertical rock formation is over 1,000 meters high. They'll be hoping to break more records and there may even be another film. Well, the annual Chelsea Flower Show in Britain is a major showcase for trends in terms of European gardening developments. And this year's edition, just last month, saw a huge emphasis on naturalistic elements. Well, it's interesting that here in Germany, people have traditionally favoured more manicured lawns and rather structured gardens. But lately, the wild seeds of rebellion seem to have sprouted here too. The natural garden. It's like a piece of nature left to run wild. But in reality, it's carefully planned. German landscape architect Petra Pelz specializes in natural gardens. She says there's a growing demand for gardens that look wild. Everything's getting faster and more technical. We work at computers, we race from one place to another in our cars, so there's a growing desire to be in nature and the outdoors. We have less time, so the gardens need to be easy to look after. There are lots of things that have led to these gardens becoming so popular. For a long time, formal gardens with carefully clipped lawns and hedges were considered the ultimate in garden design. But natural gardens have been around since the end of the 19th century. The focus is on wild grass and shrubs planted so they flourish without a huge amount of tending. And as Pelz's garden near the German city of Magdeburg shows, the natural garden retains its charm in all seasons. You can't manipulate anything in such a natural garden. The plants need time from blooming until dying. You can perhaps spread a bit of manure, but in fact you actually slow down and learn to live with these natural processes. One of the pioneers of natural gardening is Piet Odolf. The Dutchman is known around the world for his creations. They often look like wild flower meadows. He has his own garden on the edge of Hummelo, an hour's drive from Amsterdam. In summer, the garden is open to visitors. Of course, the years that we were busy, 20 years ago, they had a lot of uh, uh, refuse that people didn't like what we were doing. The traditional people that we were using grasses that was not done in English gardens. And so we had still, uh, and that, that faded away. In 2009, Udolf converted an abandoned elevated railway in New York into a park. The Lurie Garden in Chicago and other international projects have made the 69-year-old garden designer world famous. In this time, people are attracted to nature more than ever, uh, to plants. I think it's part of an inner need that we want to do more with our lives and we realize that uh, things go wrong and plants is, uh, are a medium for that. Natural gardens are known for their generous dimensions. Petra Pelz too mostly creates gardens in public spaces. Here she's created one for a call center in Magdeburg. We have workspaces with lots of computers and monitors. There's a lot of stress in daily life. And here you have a green oasis where the eyes can relax. But Pelz also designs gardens for private individuals. She planned this 300 square meter garden near Magdeburg for Katharina Stube. If you look, you see the plants swaying in the wind or the sun shining through the grass. It's just beautiful. 
Typical for private gardens is that only a few areas are left to run wild, while many others are carefully planned, like the arbor, the classic rose garden, or the manicured lawn. So can Germans, with their love of structure and organization, really allow their gardens to run wild? There's always a group that drives a movement. But Germans love their garden gnomes. I don't think that will change. Cultivated wildness may not be everyone's cup of tea, but it does underline a basic human need for reconnecting with nature. Well, given Germany's dynamic performance thus far at the Soccer World Cup in Brazil, we know they are doing something right. And Holger Stromberg is certainly one of the guys responsible. He is namely the national team chef, and that means that it's his job to make sure the players get all of the calories and the nutrients that they need to be top of their game. But he also takes great care to make sure that everything they eat tastes good. And so we did get the lowdown on how a World Cup chef preps his dishes. You won't find this man on the pitch in Brazil, but he's crucial for the German squad. He's been their official chef for the past seven years, cooking up power-packed meals to help keep them on the ball. And it's definitely not nine to five. On average, I work around 100 days for the national team, depending on how successful they are. If it's a good World Cup or European Championship, then my work can go up to 140 to 150 days, and in a normal year, I work around 70 days. Holger Stromberg started his preparations well before the World Cup, finding out where to source the best food. He wasn't allowed to bring anything with him to Brazil. It was important to me to check out things, to get a taste of the place. I knew it would be a big adventure. It's simply a completely different continent with a different lifestyle. As always, the players have to stick to a strict diet here in South America, too. Eating lots of vegetables is important. Stromberg ensures that his players eat enough salad by adding a sweet and spicy dressing. It's all very fresh, very colorful. Yes, it goes down very well with the players, and I managed to make vegetables a bit more exciting. And nutritious, too. Stromberg's salad is said to be midfielder Mesut Özil's favorite food, although the green stuff will be replaced by an all-time classic before Germany's next game against Ghana. Franz Beckenbauer probably ate it when he was on the national team. It's pasta with tomato sauce, bolognese, with Parmesan cheese, but some prefer to eat it just with olive oil. Stromberg has already accompanied the German team to three big tournaments and was with them for the Euro 2012 in Poland and Ukraine. He's responsible for the player's entire nutritional plan, from breakfast to supper. He sometimes works 20 hours a day. When he's not feeding Germany's footballers, Holger Stromberg runs two restaurants in Munich and in the Ruhr area. And in a bit of a twist, he even has his own fast food chain. Of course, I wouldn't serve something like this before a game. After all, the players are not on holiday. It's a reward for them, and that's how the coach sees it too. If the game goes well, then he says, Holger, we're barbecuing tomorrow. And then I set up the grill, and the team have really earned it. Having a good time is also part of the job. And even though Stromberg likes a game of table football from time to time, he's not good at it on the pitch. I'm a huge football fan, but I'm a really bad player. I grew up on a different field. The kitchen is my world. I can do that, and I would even say that I'm on the national team. I'm really good. And to be really good, he has to relax from time to time, which is what he did back home in Munich before flying off to Brazil to help Germany lift the World Cup.
Well, it was during his own studies in design that Dirk van der Kooi from the Netherlands first came across a 3D printer. He decided to make the technology his own and has wound up becoming a pioneer of sustainable design. Well, he now specializes in furniture and always uses reclaimed materials such that one day somebody's cast off refrigerator could wind up as your next coffee table. We've got the story. These chairs are made from plastic thread, seemingly endless lines woven into a sturdy piece of furniture. What's unusual is that they come out of a printer. Dirk van der Kooi is the man behind the idea. It's not just the creation of new forms that interests the Dutch designer. For me, it's always about the material and the structure that uh, should be new and should be interesting. Um, and, and this is actually w what I want to do as a designer. At an old industrial site 30 kilometers from Amsterdam, van der Kooi has a workshop, studio and showroom under one roof. His company uses robotics technology to print all its furniture. This robotic arm was once used in the auto industry. During his studies, van der Kooi spent 18 months adapting it until his first chair was ready. The first half year I was really amazed and so happy that it succeeded. And so nice that the chair has always been made in a, in a perfect speed without my control. That's a kind of a relief. It works by applying layer after layer of liquid plastic. It takes up to three hours until a chair is ready. The raw material is plastic particles. They come from old shredded refrigerators. It, it just makes me feel better. And this is not like, I'm, I'm not the, the guy that is completely uh, not harmful to the environment because I drive a car. Uh, I wore my house on gas, I think. Um, but it's, I think it's, if, it, if it could be done, uh, then it's always nicer to do it from reclaimed materials. His creations cost between 300 and 2,000 euros. Museums all over the world are interested in his furniture. His works have been displayed in New York, London, and Berlin. Other Dutch designers are also experimenting with the 3D printing process. Joris Larman, for example, has designed a chair that is made of plastic puzzle pieces, all made with a printer. The designer also works with other materials. His special robots can print metal. The first piece of furniture made with this technique is the dragon bench. It is a way to see way more faster in real the thing you envisionized. And this way designing is more from the screen into the, to, into the real. Um, but it's also when you have the first one made, you could also easily make more. Everybody could start up their own little company with traditional 3D printing. In conventional furniture production, plastic resin is poured into a metal mold. All pieces created in this process are identical. But that's not how Dirk van der Kooi does it. Each piece of his furniture is unique. The designer can alter the plans at any time on the computer. A program translates them into digital data that can be read and implemented by the robot. But every detail counts. You cannot just cross lines or you cannot, you have to consider that the lines, every mistake you make is going to be ugly smudge in the chair. So yeah, you have to guide the lines perfectly. 3D technology is not just a means of production, but also a means of inspiration for the 30 year old. Well, a, a little house we would certainly want to, to create and uh, not with typical 3D printing, but adapting the technique in that way that is actually logical that you do it, that you could create a house with this technique. Now, I should not tell more. Yeah. <laughs> 
He's not interested in standardized production. Imperfections are an integral part of Dirk van der Koei's designs. Well, the Art Basel in Switzerland is the world's premier international art show, and this year's edition staged a very novel live exhibit. The exhibition called 14 Rooms allowed 14 internationally renowned artists to show very different installations, but with one thing in common. They all used human beings as their raw materials. Well, the idea was to explore the relationships between space, time and physicality, and to get visitors interacting with the protagonists. 14 doors, each one leading into a room with a live work of art. From the gravity-defying performer of Shanghai-based Zhu Chen, to Spanish artist Santiago Sierra and his alienated veterans, they were all created by high-profile artists. Jennifer Ayora and Guillermo Calzadilla have created a piece called Revolving Door, in which dancers rotate around the room spontaneously. You have to focus on not being a person in certain situations. You have to suppress your laughter when funny situations arise. You have to be fully present. In one group, somebody began to count really loudly, which created a difficult situation for these performers because they couldn't follow the rhythm correctly. British artist Damien Hirst created this installation called Hans Georg in 1992. He seated identical twins in front of his spot paintings. Stephanie and Melanie are among the rotating cast of twins for this year's version, as are Raphael and Leonard. The works, some of which are new, others that are old but have rarely been performed, all explore the relationship between space, time and physicality and they can have varying impacts on visitors to the exhibition. I had a feeling of voyeurism, which was unpleasant at the beginning, but then it turned into a sense of fascination. I think it's very um, breathtaking to see real humans as part of the art because um, it kind of connects with you on another level, especially when you make eye contact with the performers. It's a bit confusing and disarming. It also causes a feeling of unpleasantness. It's not a commodity like other art. Ah, what have we got here? A clip. In his piece entitled Swap, Slovakian artist Roman Ondak asks performers to choose an object to exchange with visitors. A tube of hand cream or a USB stick, for example. Do you want to swap? I really want you to swap that because you found it on the street. I think it's wonderful. Would you swap that for me? Yeah. Okay, thank you. Okay, I have 20 Swiss francs. There we go. 20 Swiss francs. Who'll give me 50 Swiss francs for that? <laughs> People make artwork sometimes in the room. Someone will draw a beautiful piece of art or write a, a story or a poem. This is a lovely way to engage children as well. Often children are in the room, so to engage children, we often get them to do a drawing or something like this and, uh, and they'll exchange it. In Ottobong Nkanga's new work, Diaspora, performers have been given the challenging task of balancing a plant called Queen of the Night on their heads. There are some things that are structured, very structured, and there are some things that are left for improvisation. They know when they come into the room, this is where I stand, but Within that, they can improvise with the emotion of the voice. It's the third installment of this exhibition of live art performances in Basel. The curators are Hans-Ulrich Obrist, co-director of London's Serpentine Gallery, and Klaus Biesenbach, director of MoMA PS1 in New York. The three or four generations gathered here show that live art has interested artists for some time. It was important to us to bring them together here. It's not just about art history, it's also about human life. I don't think visitors need any expertise for this kind of exhibition. It's easy to perceive its radical nature, and yet it also has something to do with art history. Fourteen Rooms, an exhibition that adds a new dimension to contemporary art, running now in Basel through June 22nd. 
And that's all for this edition of our Euromax Highlights. So until we meet again, alles Gute von uns aus Berlin. Tschüss und auf Wiedersehen.